It's only when you come to a place like this that you take time to look up at the sky. On a deserted Hawaiian beach, far from cities, streetlights and the bustle of traffic, you really begin to feel the power and the beauty of the stars in the sky. And as you look up, the inevitable questions come into your mind, like, where did all those stars come from? How far away are they? And what are they? It's only in the past few years that we've learned the answers to those questions. And along the way, we've uncovered links between ourselves and the stars that go deeper than we ever suspected. This series is all about stars, how they're born, how they live, and how they die. It's about their different personalities, and it's about the astronomers who devote their lives to studying the stars, how and why they do it. But our relationship with the stars goes back thousands of years to the dawn of mankind. And it all began in the quest for places like this. Over a thousand years ago, Polynesian travelers in twin-hulled canoes were able to sail right across the Pacific Ocean from Tahiti to Hawaii, a distance of 2,000 miles. They colonized the tiny islands they discovered dotted across the ocean. And, like the men crewing the Hokulea, a replica of one of the old canoes, they navigated without the aid of a magnetic compass, sextant, or a clock. The method they used to navigate has been passed down through the centuries by many generations of sailors. It relies mainly on the pattern of stars in the sky, the star compass. The system taught to me by the star compass comes from my teacher who is a Micronesian navigator from the island of Sadawal. What it is is um, what we call houses. Houses are the places where the stars come up and where they set. There's 32 points on the horizon that we roughly equally space where certain stars rise and where they set. And the stars, we use them for a number of different ways. One is to hold direction. Uh, where they rise and where they set those uh, azimuths, so to speak, are, are bearings that we can use to um, steer the canoe. And the other ways that we use the stars are for telling uh, latitude or our distance from the equator. And we just estimate their height visually. So we use a relationship between gay crux and a crux and the southern cross and the distance from the bottom star to the horizon. When the Polynesians were at Tahiti, south of the equator, they could see that the group of stars forming the Southern Cross was 37 degrees above the horizon. When they sailed north towards Hawaii, the Southern Cross sank lower towards the horizon because they were traveling around the curved surface of the Earth. This allowed them to get an accurate fix on latitude. When the Southern Cross was only six degrees above the horizon, they knew they had reached the correct latitude for Hawaii, just north of the equator. Using this method of star navigation, the Polynesians were able to travel thousands of miles across the vast Pacific, a journey that must have been as incredible to them as it would be for us to travel to the stars themselves. Unlike the Polynesians, modern man is not dependent at all on being able to recognize the constellations in the night sky. But to astronomers like Ben Mayer, studying the stars is a passionate hobby. On the rooftop of his home, high above Hollywood, Ben photographs the night sky. He has built his own special tracking device, capable of following the stars through the night as the Earth rotates. And as his camera automatically clicks away, Ben can relax at the back of his home for a bit of stargazing. And it's a really great place to do astronomy. It's the only way to do astronomy. <laughs> it's certainly very, very warm. What's up there tonight? You can see constellation of Taurus. Uh-huh. From there to about there, this whole triangle there is the head of Taurus, with Aldebaran, the brightest star, smack dab in the middle there. Yeah. And on the right, on the top, you can see the Seven Sisters, also known, as you well know, as the Pleiades. But in the middle of Taurus and Gemini is my favorite constellation just there, Orion the Hunter. The three stars are right up there. Yeah. Fantastic. Ben, what 
then we're old hands at knowing which star is which. But beginners always find it difficult to work out one star from the other. And it occurs to me that one way to do it might be to actually tell them about their zodiac signs, because that would actually mean something to them. If you can get people to see the sign that they are born under, the zodiac sign, which they know, all know, if you can get them to see that grouping, that constellation in the sky, you've just, just about converted them into astronomy. Not into astrology, into what I call observational astrology. And if you can find, help people find their way in the sky through their constellation, here's what you do. I have a special surprise for you, Helen. Hi. This is a star frame, which I hold up against the sky, and we looked at Aldebaran just now, the brightest star in Taurus. And over here, you can see the Pleiades. If you hold this the correct distance from your eye, and that distance can be controlled in advance, about 15, 16 inches from your eye, then you have three dimensions. The north, south, one dimension. The east, west is the second dimension. And the in, out dimension is the third dimension. If you can control those three dimensions, then you're just about home and can show anybody where their constellation is. So what you do is you actually get your constellation chart and you put it in this frame exactly. and it's the same procedure for every single one. The only thing that changes is the insert in the frame. Ben, that's a brilliant invention. And thank you very much for sharing it with us. My pleasure, Heather. Thank you. Aldebaran is just one of the thousands of stars we can see in the sky. To help them recognize which star was which, our ancestors divided the heavens up into many different patterns, like the constellations of Taurus and Orion. For convenience, the world governing body of astronomy, the International Astronomical Union, recognizes 88 official constellation patterns, mainly those that were handed down to us by the ancient Greeks. At least this way, everyone knows which part of the sky everybody else is talking about. But different cultures in the world have always divided up the sky in different ways. This American drawing shows the rear of the Great Bear as a Big Dipper. We Europeans call it the Plow. The ancient Chinese joined it up in much the same way, but they basically saw the sky as a myriad of much smaller star groups. They were able to make up their own exotic beasts from just two or three stars. The Aborigines of Australia had such brilliantly clear night skies that individual stars merged together as immense star clouds separated by dark areas. Their constellations like the emu, were shapes drawn around the bright and dark clouds. The emu was silhouetted against the Milky Way. As well as using the stars for navigation, early cultures, like the Egyptians and the Chinese, employed the stars as a giant celestial clock to tell the time at night. As seen from the surface of our spinning Earth, the stars appear to move, rising in the east, and setting in the west. This is caused by the Earth rotating on its axis once every 24 hours. But each night is brought to a close by the rising of one particular star. A star so brilliant that it makes all the others fade from sight. It is the Sun, our local star. And that's just what the sun is, a star, but one so close it lights up our entire world. You can get some feel for the sun by realizing that it lies 93 million miles away from us and its heat and light has come that far. It's a body so vast you could fit one million Earths inside it. And to keep itself shining, it consumes four million tons of itself every second. And yet it's been giving out energy at that rate for the last five billion years. In the daytime, the other stars are still up there. We just can't see them because of the sunlight scattered in our atmosphere. But if you could strip away the atmosphere, you would see the sun against the stars. 
And if you were able to watch for long enough, you would notice that the sun slowly moves against the starry background, taking exactly one year to make the complete circuit. But it's not actually the sun that's moving. The drift is caused by the Earth's year-long journey about the sun itself, following an orbit of 600 million miles. To the astronomers of the past, the sun's annual jaunt around the heavens provided them with a calendar. By observing the stars that remained on view, that's to say those that weren't actually covered up behind the sun, they were able to work out how far the sun had got around the sky and therefore what time of year it was. And by looking at those stars, they were able to predict certain seasonal events. For instance, if you lived in a place like this, which is a dry, dusty desert, the annual floods would come as a welcome relief. And that's just what the ancient Egyptians did. When they saw the brilliant star Sirius rising with the dawn, they knew that the Nile floods were just a few days away. And in those few days, the crops would be irrigated and there'd be a welcome relief from the drought. Of course, there was no connection between what was going on up there in the sky and what was happening down here on Earth. It was just a combination of the Earth moving around the sun, so you saw different stars in the sky, and the seasons, which changed the weather patterns. But inevitably, some people claim there was a link. They believe that the stars along the sun's path, the 12 constellations of the zodiac, somehow influenced earthly events. And so astrology was born. Astrologers later were to say that the stars affected human destiny. And that's something an awful lot of people believe, even today. If there's one thing you can guarantee, it's that virtually everybody knows their zodiac sign, the sign the sun was against, or in, when they were born. Well, I was born on June the 2nd. According to the astrologers, that was when the sun was bang in the middle of Gemini. So, on my birthday, I should see the sun in Gemini. But in fact, it's in Taurus. And if you think you were born under Taurus, you'd actually find the sun was in Aries. Why does everything appear to have slipped by a month? 2,000 years ago, when the constellation patterns we use were first drawn up, the sun was in Gemini on June the 2nd. But the Earth's axis is slowly shifting around in space, which causes our perspective on the stars to slip as years go by. So the signs of the zodiac will slip further and further. It's something that astrologers don't talk about much. Well, you can't blame them, really. After all, Gemini won't coincide with the month of June again until the year 26,000 AD. Unlike the astronomers of thousands of years ago, we don't just rely on our eyes to look at the stars. Since the 17th century, astronomers have had telescopes. Over the past four centuries, they have grown bigger and much more sophisticated. The huge, complex telescopes of today bring the stars nearer than ever before. Modern astronomers can look deep into space, and they have discovered a universe far more complex and beautiful than astrology could ever have predicted. We no longer see the stars as a two-dimensional pattern of dots on the sky, but as individual suns grouped into galaxies. The constellation of Orion may have looked like a huntsman to our ancestors, but in fact the stars all lie at very different distances from Earth. If you were able to travel around any constellation, its shape would completely change, and you would discover that the stars weren't associated at all. When you think about it, it's perhaps been rather arrogant of us to carve up the heavens to our own designs. Okay, it's long helped us find our time and our place, but now it's completely served its purpose, because we are no longer tied to the Earth. Our future lies in travelling the expanses of space. And already, cousins of this Voyager space probe here have made a very thorough job of exploring our cosmic backyard. Voyager 2 was sent to the remote outer planets of our solar system. It scanned the rings of Saturn in 1981, four years after its launch. Five years later, it reached Uranus, a dark and icy world remote from the sun's radiance.
it will pass Neptune in mid-1989. Neptune, at the edge of our solar system, lies almost 3,000 million miles from Earth. By the time that Voyager reaches Neptune, it will have been traveling through space for more than 12 years. But after that, when it leaves the solar system and starts to travel amongst the realms of the stars, it won't pass its first star for another 40,000 years. And just to get that into perspective, it was 40,000 years ago that Neanderthal man lived on this planet. And Voyager isn't traveling slowly, it's tearing through space at more than 10 miles a second. But if we're ever to reach the stars in a reasonable time, that's within a human lifetime, if we're ever to build true starships, we will have to build craft that can go at least a thousand times faster than Voyager. Even if we could build a craft that would travel at the speed of light, that's 186,000 miles per second, the maximum speed anything can go in the universe, it would still take 4.3 years to reach the nearest star beyond the sun. If you allow a comfortable rate of acceleration and deceleration for the crew, the round trip would take at least 16 years. And no spacecraft has been invented that could even approach the speed of light. Bob Forward is an aerospace engineer who lives in California. He's been studying the problems of interstellar flight for many years. He realized that rockets, which power our present spacecraft, can never produce enough acceleration because they have to carry the weight of their own fuel. So he has come up with some revolutionary designs that dispense with the need for rockets entirely. The ideas that I've been working on involve using very powerful lasers to push sails through space, and the sails would carry the space vehicle. The powerful lasers, of course, are being developed by the Space Defense Initiative, and future versions of those machines, of those lasers, would be built in space, and then we'd beam the laser beams using the technology, again developed in the Space Defense Initiative, to push the vehicles through space using the photon pressure from the light, from the laser. This craft would fly straight past the star it was aimed at. So the design includes a detachable capsule, which would be slowed down by bouncing the laser beam back from the main sail. Bob Ford has also designed a craft he hopes to see launched in his own lifetime, an unmanned probe called Star Wisp. This would also be laser powered, but it would be made of a very special wire mesh and only weigh 20 grams. Star Wisp will be accelerated at 115 Gs and will reach 20% of the speed of light. And that means it will get to the nearest star systems in 16 to 20 years. Uh, then will, of course, take four or five years for the signal to come back. Many ideas for starships are being considered. This one is called an interstellar ramjet. And someday, someone is going to invent a design that can be built. But how easy will it be to find a crew? We're all on a one-way journey through life. And so therefore, sending a person on a one-way trip to the stars that takes his whole lifetime is not a suicide mission. A person gets to do a job that's very exciting. And really, when, when you and I work, we work for all of our lives. Hopefully it's something that's interesting. If it really is interesting, uh, we don't want to retire, we die with our boots on. These people would be the same way. There'll be something reassuringly familiar about the skies seen from the neighborhood of our nearest star. Because we have traveled such a short distance, astronomically speaking, most of the star patterns will look exactly as they do back at home. There's just one thing that's new, one of those undistinguished looking stars in the sky is our own star, the Sun. But is all this ever going to happen? Or is it just a fairy tale? After all, human beings are designed physically and mentally to cope with conditions on Earth. Can we adapt to become a spacefaring species? 
we're going into space, we as a species that is, sometime, and we'll settle on planets within the solar system, and I think eventually we'll go interstellar and settle around other stars. All those places we think are uninhabited. Now, the same case with the Polynesians. They, their ancestors rather, set off from Southeast Asia, started working their way into the Pacific. The first islands they came to were already inhabited, but soon they came to, every island they came to was uninhabited, and they kept pushing and pushing because they were the only people in that part of the world. Every island, therefore, was new and virgin, open to them. I think we have the same prospect open to us in our solar system and probably in other stellar systems. We're the animal that, that expands by developing technology. We go where we shouldn't biologically be. Once we've developed the technology to get up, get large vehicles up to about half the speed of light, then I really do see the human race colonizing other, other planets around other stars. We're going to have to send our robotic probes first to find a habitable planet. But then I think the imperative that's in all of us to expand will send humans to the stars. And like the Polynesians, only a few people will go. Uh, probably will be a, a very picked genetic pool of a few dozen people. And then they will colonize, not by, we will colonize not by sending more people, but by just letting the population grow. navigators who are able to cover vast tracts of the Pacific Ocean, our age-old instinct to follow the stars may lead us to more than we have ever imagined. This instinct has already led to the colonization of our own planet, just as it will undoubtedly lead to the colonization of others. Perhaps in the not very distant future, as our space-faring descendants learn to travel freely throughout our solar system, they'll begin to regard space, and not the Earth, as their natural habitat. And at that point, it will seem the most natural thing in the universe to reach for the stars. When we venture deeper into space, the comforting familiarity of the sky will vanish. Our time-honored star patterns will dissolve as we leave the sun behind, and we will start to appreciate the real layout of stars in space, the way they make up our star city, the Milky Way. In the far distant future, we may look down on this immense congregation of 200 billion stars and seek our star living somewhere in the outer suburbs. It lies about two-thirds of the way out from the center in one of the galaxy's spiral arms. But future spacefarers will look for it in vain. It is far too dim to be visible. Yet we might not even be homesick, for by then we will not merely be inhabitants of planet Earth, but citizens of the universe. <laughs>